Jesus' name, amen. Well, does anybody really care? Have you asked that question lately? I know I have, just in various encounters that I've had. And it's funny because I tend to be the type of person that when I can sense somebody doesn't care, I typically am critical of them rather than having compassion for them. It's interesting because um, this has happened to me a few times. It's, it's so wild, but like, I was at, I think, uh, not to throw this convenience store under the bus, but I was at a Casey's uh, one afternoon, and, and I was at another retail shop, and the folks that were checking me out, man, they were like, they were multitaskers. I mean, they were like checking me out and like on their phone at the same time. <laughs> Have you experienced this lately? Maybe this is just, maybe God was just setting me up for this message. And there's just something in me that's thinking like, man, my, my experience inside your business is jaded right now because you really don't care to be here. And I can just tell because you're totally disengaged with, with me. I'm a customer. Like, hey, I'd like to just see how your day is going. But you're like down texting while you're checking me out, disengaged. And yeah, I guess it's the consultant in me. I tend to be judgmental and criticize in those moments rather than having compassion. But it's really interesting. I've been thinking about this idea of, of do we really care? You know, even culturally, you see that empathy's on the decline and apathy's on the incline. How do I know this? Because more people would rather film your tragedy than actually help you in the midst of it. Like, are we a culture that really cares any longer? Uh, it's funny because uh, it's actually been a while since, since I've been in the pulpit. I think the last time I was, was scheduled to preach, I got asked to go uh, preach at an FCA like conference out in uh, Grand Island, Nebraska. And it's funny because I consider that Western Nebraska, but I learned that that's actually central Nebraska. <laughs> Come on now. So this was the first like speaking or preaching trip that I took my son Jude on, which was absolutely incredible. And I don't want to get a sidetrack. I could tell you 10 things that I loved about that experience with him, but it felt like we were truly doing ministry together. I mean, in between sessions, this young man was like praying for me and praying for students to come to Christ. I got done preaching my first session. He came up to me. He's like, dad, you rocked it. <laughs> After about two sessions, though, he was like, man, these encounters are pretty long. <laughs> I was like, man, was he trying to tell me I was long winded? But our trek out there was so interesting. Um, I, I drive a Volkswagen Passat. And on this particular uh, weekend in November, it was the weekend in November where it was like nine or 10 degrees on a Friday and Saturday. I don't, I don't know the date, but it was brutal. And so me and Judah hop in the, in the Passat and we're, we're heading out there. And the thing is, is I forgot that my heater's broken in my car. I'm like, okay, OC, come on, man. Like, you have taught. Just look at me and say failure. <laughs> because it was an epic failure. I'm about like an hour down the road, no joke. My son's hands are red in the back because he wants to hold the iPad and watch a you know, movie on the drive out, which I don't blame him. So I'm feeling guilty. My son's hands are red in the back. And your boy's car is not frosting on the outside, but on the inside. I mean, I'm driving down Interstate 80. I'm like, I need my ice scraper for the inside. <laughs> oh, geez. Brutal. It was brutal. And uh, so anyways, you guys are like, get to the point. Get to the Bible. Let's go. So anyways, finally, this past week, I take it into the shop to get fixed. And I love my mechanic. So there's a point to this story. He really cares. Like this man, he's got like the one stall shop, old school, like just dude just loves to work. He's there till like 8 p.m. God bless him. And I'll tell you what, I don't really care to know anything about how to work on a car. But praise God for those of you that do. And so I give him my car and... He's like, I got to take the dash out Volkswagen, man. They make their cars great. 
but in order to fix this, it's gonna take a lot of work. So he looks into it and he says, hey, here's what's going on. You got some blend doors that need to repair, be repaired. And, uh, and so I'm like, all right, I'll bite the bullet. Let's do it. Come on, I need some heat in the car. I'm carrying around these kids, man. I gotta be a responsible adult, amen? <laughs> well, I show up there on, on Friday to pick it up and I'm like, oh yes, heat back in my car, perfect timing. And he's like, yeah, um, so I got in there and I was working around and I was looking around and I noticed that some like things were unscrewed on the inside and there were some parts that were like laying and there was this piece that was broken that was like duct tape with like some black tape. And I was like, oh yeah, I forgot that I used to live next to a mechanic and this was like a while ago. So my heater has been broken for a while, don't judge me. So I had this mechanic that lived next to me take a look at it, and he must have not have really cared. Because when he got in there, he didn't put it back together right, he broke some things and didn't tell me. By the way, I paid the guy, he didn't complete the job, and he just bounced on me. So there's a lesson here. Do you see the contrast here? One mechanic didn't care at all. The other mechanic cared deeply, and I got back into my whip, and stuff was buttoned up and put together and the heat was on. I called him up because I was so happy. I was like, man, it's hot in my car. He's like, what are you talking about? Is it overheating? I'm like, no, man, the heat works again. Praise God. So when you recognize that people care, you better tell them thank you. Express some gratitude. Okay, so why do I tell this long intro? Because when we look at Nehemiah, this is one of the sweetest things. God uses him in a powerful time in history. When, 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 when the, the, the people of God, Jerusalem, are in ruins, God wants to do a restoration. There, there's rubble and God wants to do reconstruction. He uses this man, Nehemiah, and we see right from the jump that he's a man that cares. He cares. So let's check it out. Nehemiah chapter one, verses one through three, it says this. These are the memoirs of Nehemiah, son of, you, you, you got it, in late autumn in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was at the fortress of Susa, Hananiah, one of, the, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who had returned there from captivity and about how things were going in Jerusalem. Now pause here. Remember, just like PT set up last week, and really if you think about the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, it's really just one story broken down in two separate books. And the Jewish people during this time were in captivity in Babylon, and they were in captivity for 70 years. Why? Because for 490 years, they disobeyed the Sabbath, and they kept falling into idolatry. And so God's form of judgment on his people was for them to be taken in captivity by the Babylonians. Now, there came a point with the Babylonians that they were conquered by uh, Medo-Persia, and so what's interesting is God used King Cyrus, who was one of the kings of the Persians, to kind of be the catalyst to give the Jewish people charge to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the what? The temple, that's where they started. And God used Rebabel and Azra to begin that project. And P.T. talked about that, that last week when he talked about rebuilding from ruins to rebuilding when the people went back to build the temple. And so that's a little context of what's going on here. So Nehemiah never spent one day of his life in Jerusalem. His brother goes there, comes back, and Nehemiah cares enough in his heart to ask him about the Jews and about the city. Verse three, it says this, they said to me, things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. 
So that's the report of what's going on. So in other words, the city wall had been torn down. Now, why was this such an important piece to a city back in this particular day? Is because it was a, it was a form of protection. It was a form of security. It was a, it was a form of strength, really, because Outside enemies would try to take over cities and conquer, and the wall was used as a form of defense. And so you can see here that the brothers coming back with a report that the wall's been torn down, the gates have been destroyed. And so the first uh, point that I wanna leave with you guys today is this. You can write this down. He cared enough to ask. He cared enough to ask. So in this particular time period, and you'll see this in verse 11 of this chapter, we read that Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king. Now this was a position of great responsibility and privilege. In order to fulfill this position, you had to be handsome, cultured, you had to be knowledgeable, you had to be a good leader, you had to have strong character. Because of his proximity to the king, we also know that Nehemiah had influence. So we know that Nehemiah didn't live in Jerusalem. So the question is, is why did he care about this report from his brother? These people were living hundreds of miles away, and after all, he was living a life of success. He was secure in his life in Persia. Well, a century and a half before, the prophet Jeremiah told us this moment in history would happen in Jeremiah 15, five, when he said this, Who will feel sorry for you, Jerusalem? Who will weep for you? Who will even bother to ask how you are? Nehemiah was the man God had chosen to do those very things. And on this ordinary day, it would be his caring heart that would open the door to his calling. So when we truly care about people, we want the facts no matter how painful they may be. So I want to ask us a question. Do you and I accept the facts or do we plug our ears and cover our eyes to them? Aldous Huxley said this, facts do not cease to exist because they are ignored. Closing our ears and eyes to the truth could be the first step towards tragedy for ourselves and others. Nehemiah asked his brother because he cared. He cared because he remained curious. And I think many of us have stopped caring because we've stopped being curious. Have you stopped being curious? I don't know about you, but that tends to be my tendency. My my tendency in the midst of chaos is denial. It's to, you know, we've all been there. You're in the grocery store and you see see that person walking down the aisle and you're like, well, I'm just going to go this way. Oh, don't lie to me. You know you've been there. But so many of us, we're we're asking this question, God, what do you have for me? What's my purpose? What's my calling? When really we need to be laying it, we need to be leaning into and asking God to burden our hearts, to give us a heart that actually cares for a lost and dying world, for a people that are broken. Because I don't know about you, But when we read texts like this, sometimes it's hard for our minds to connect to this reality because we don't have walls that surround the city of Omaha. We we don't see walls that have fallen down. We don't see rubble from walls that are broken, but we can look around at people who are broken. Do you see the brokenness all around us? Do you see how dark it's getting? Do you see the hopelessness in our world? Well, last time I checked, you and I are called to be salt and light in the midst of the darkness. We're called to bring hope into a hopeless world. Do you believe it this morning? Now, I think a perfect picture of this is in Luke chapter 10. I love this. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus tells this story, and I think we ought to lean in and pay attention. I think there's a great connection here to the spirit that Nehemiah is carrying and the spirit that the Good Samaritan is carrying is carrying. So the story goes that there was this man who was on his way from Jerusalem to Jericho. The Bible tells us that he was, uh, that he encountered some bandits. And I'm not talking about the sticky bandits from Home Alone. How many of y'all been watching that in this season? Just on repeat. Yeah. I love you. Home Alone 1 and 2 all day. 
So this guy encounters some bandits. They beat him up. It says to near death. They take his clothes. Can you imagine? Like this dude was beaten, naked, embarrassed, barely breathing. And it just pains my heart because the Bible talks about that there was a priest, a priest. These are like the people that are supposed to be nearest and dearest to God, the closest. They're the ones that have it all together, right? And he's walking down the street towards this man. And we know this uh, in Jewish customs that a priest could not touch a dead man because then he couldn't do ministry for like seven days or something. So Jesus is telling this story, this Jewish man, this Jewish priest, the one that's supposed to care for the broken people, sees the broken man and does one of these numbers, walks across the street and just walks on by. Jesus says a second person is walking towards the man. It was a temple assistant. So not a priest, but one that's hanging around a bunch of priests, sees the man and crosses the street and walks by him. But then a good Samaritan comes along. Remember, the Samaritans and the Jews, it was almost like there was beef amongst them. The good Samaritan sees this man, and he cares for him, so much so that he puts him on his own donkey and takes him to an inn and like cleans him with olive oil and wine and makes sure he's taken care of and then pays the innkeeper and says, yo, if he needs to stay here longer, then I'll reimburse you when I come back through. Can you see the heart? He cared, and, 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 and I know that this is connected to what this man saw, and I'm saying, yo, Nehemiah, he, he, he cared because he asked. In other words, why was he even thinking about this? Why was he caring about this? But we need to take inventory. What are we asking? What are we seeing? And is that creating something in us that burden, burdens us enough to do something about it? Because we're not just called to be consumers in the church. We're not called to just come in here and get fat and happy. We're called to go out of these doors and take the love of Jesus Christ into the streets. We are the answer to God's mission. It's you and I. We've got the Holy Spirit inside each of us. And guess what? Jesus was powerful and impactful and perfect. But he came and he died on the cross so that we could be restored back into right relationship with him. But I believe he did it because of a greater mission. He knew that he could only have so much impact, but the Holy Spirit in all of us could go throughout the earth and see many people saved and surrendered and redeemed and healed. Is anybody with me today? He cared. He cared because he asked. Now, the question that we've got to ask ourselves is when we ask and when we hear what's really going on or when we see a situation, what is our response? Which leads me to verse four. Check this out. How would he respond to this news? Verse four, when I heard this, Nehemiah speaking, I sat down and I love this and I wept. I wept. There's so many things that I see in this passage that connect back to the heart of Jesus. Remember when Jesus stood over the city of Jerusalem and wept? Here's Nehemiah. He's weeping when he hears that, that his lineage, his ancestral city, that, that his people, a people that he hasn't even, like he never experienced that. It must have just been passed down through story. But it moved, in, it moved him in such a deep way that he wept. It says, in fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. So the second thing that I want to share with you today is he cared enough to pray. The news broke Nehemiah's heart because he cared so deeply. He wept. I believe he wept because I believe God laid a burden on him in this moment. He was being impregnated with a woe. And so I wanna release some people in here today. Don't hide your weeping, lean into it. It's an indicator because your woe becomes your flow. The news that broke him became the burden that moved him. This is what God does, is he burdens our heart 
not to break us, but to burden us so we'll actually do something about it. And I just want to pause and take a time out right now, and I want to speak this and prophesy this over somebody in here, that you feel broken, you feel used, you can't believe the situation that you walk through. But God wants to repurpose your pain for purpose. And I'm here to speak over your life today that that brokenness that you experience will become your ministry if you'll believe it, if you'll let him heal you, if you'll let him walk with you, if you'll let him be your great counselor. He wants to use your brokenness to give you a burden to be a solution in culture. Do you believe it in this house today? That's what's happening here. He's impregnating Nehemiah with a woe, with a woe. And I like how Warren Wiersbe says it. He says it like this. Our tears water the seeds of providence that God has planted on our path. And without our tears, those seeds could never grow and produce fruit. I love what the Bible says. Those who sow in tears will reap in joy. So I want to ask you a question today. What's burdening your soul? What's burdening your soul? Because I I believe there's a shift that's gonna happen in here today. If you answer the question, I don't know, I believe you're gonna stop asking God, what's my calling? And you're gonna press into prayer the caller, and you're gonna start praying, God, I don't want a calling without a burden. I need a burden, I need a woe. I need you to break my heart for what breaks yours and that's the secret sauce because when you get into the secret place, he starts to share with you what's breaking his heart. Can anybody testify to this? That's what we're called to. And so how did Nehemiah respond? There's only one way he could respond. He began to pray and fast. I wanna give a, a plug here. Starting in January, our church, this church, Love Church, We're gonna launch into a 21 days of prayer and fasting. And we'll share more on this, but 21 days of prayer and fasting. And I I just believe that when it comes to prayer and fasting, these are spiritual disciplines in the church that we haven't always done a great job. I'm talking big C church. We haven't always done a great job at discipling people in prayer and fasting. Fasting is powerful. You wanna experience breakthrough in your life? Cause your flesh to die from something that it craves every single day. You will experience breakthrough. And this is what Nehemiah's response was. He's he's overcome with this woe and this burden. There's only one thing he knows to do. It's to pray and fast. Don't you love it? Now, as we read the book of Nehemiah, this prayer right here that Nehemiah is gonna pray was the first of 12 instances of prayer recorded in the book of Nehemiah. So I just want us to catch this. This is the secret sauce to Nehemiah's success. Prayer was what revealed his motivation. It's where we saw his dependence on God. And the same is true for you and I. Prayer isn't our last resort. It's our first response. Because when you and I, when we wait on the Lord in prayer, we're not wasting our time, we're investing it. God is preparing both you and your circumstances so that his purposes will be accomplished. I love the way Alan Redpath said this. He said this, there is too much working before men and too little waiting before God. I've been guilty of that been guilty of that church and that that's just the thing man is it's so easy in this walk if we're not careful the thing that we despise becoming can actually be the very thing that we become like one thing that irked me growing up was just the religiosity that I saw in the church I grew up in a very traditional environment and I just remember being like man this just feels fake and phony it doesn't feel transformational and I want no part of that There was no passion. It didn't seem real and authentic and genuine. But we know this. All of us as humans, we're creatures of habit. That's why I love getting around people that just come to Christ. Jackson Zerlon, I don't know if he's in here right now. I actually think he's serving and love kids. Right now, he and I are doing some one-to-one discipleship. And I love getting around him. I love getting around Sam and these young guys that have this zeal and this fire. 
because it pulls me out of this, this rhythm and just this, I be, I'm becoming robotic. God wants to break us out of that today. He wants to break us out of that religiosity. He wants to reinstill the fire today. And this is gonna happen as we lean in in prayer. Check it out, verse five. Let's look at his prayer because I think there's some principles in this that we can learn. Verse five, then I said, oh Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, there's some praise, who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands. Listen to my prayer. The Psalms say to enter his gate with what? Praise and thanksgiving. It's a great way to start, expressing gratitude every single day. There's principles in this prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people, Israel. And I love this. I confess that we have sinned against you. Wait a second. Look at the humility here. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. We have sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, decrees, and regulations that you gave us through your servant Moses. Please remember what you told your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful to me, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands and live by them, then even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to the place I have chosen for my name to be honored. The people you rescued by your great power and strong hand are your servants. Oh, Lord, please hear my prayer. Listen to the prayers of those of us who delight in honoring you. Please grant me success today by making the king favorable to me. Put it into his heart to be kind to me. So you see the elements that are captured in this prayer? There's praise, there's confession, there's the promises of God are being baked into this prayer and, and it's laced with humility or what I like to say, Godfidence. It's, it's, he understands who his God is and what he can do. But I wanna specifically highlight Confession. I don't know why this was in my spirit this week. Maybe it's because I experienced it myself. I think it's interesting that there are certain weeks that you're planning to be in the pulpit and it just feels like, man, the arrows are coming. And I felt that this week. I had two all-day meetings and then on Wednesday I woke up and it was just like, it was a battle. It was a battle all day long and it felt like I lost another day. Like I just, I was off in my spirit. And I reached out to somebody that I'm accountable with and I just, I confessed. I said, yo, this is what's going on. I just wanna come before you and be honest. Here's, here's where I'm at. And uh, will you pray for me? It was so interesting because this particular individual was like, man, same with me. So here we are, we just, we had this moment of confession. It reminded me of James 5.16. It says this, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be what? Healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. I wrote this down. Confession leads to a cleansing that lifts confusion and ushers in connection, and connection always brings greater clarity. So it could be you're lacking clarity because you need to just, man, just be cleansed with the Lord through confession. Now, yes, I get it. Those of us that are in Christ Jesus, we're white as snow. We're being made perfect. When God sees us, he sees his son. You and I are perfect, but we're always in process. So confession is another spiritual discipline that's powerful. That's why James writes about it. So I want us to, want us to lean into that. And I see here that Nehemiah, he's leading, leaning into this confession. But he gets this woe, he gets this burden, and his response is to pray and to fast, to press into the Lord. And it was in the midst of praying and fasting that the burden became greater for Jerusalem and his vision became clearer about what he needed to do. So some of us read this and we're like, wait a second here, like, what did he just pray and then God granted it? When you open up chapter two, you realize that it it talks about how it fast forwards to the springtime. So we know that four months passed by. So that he was fervently praying for four months about this. Some of y'all prayed two days and then you gave up on God. It's time to turn back to him and press in and ask boldly and come before the throne of grace knowing that you serve a heavenly father that sees you and knows you. And sometimes in the waiting, there's refinement that's happening. 
There's preparation that's taken place because if he granted your request in that moment, you wouldn't be equipped or ready to handle your purpose and your calling. And so something's happening in the waiting. Do you believe it? It's waiting season, baby. Just start walking around with confidence. It's waiting season. Don't have an answer, but I know who holds the answer, and I'm going to keep pressing into him. And if he says yes, awesome. If he says no, I'm going to trust him. If he says maybe later, I'm just going to keep being faithful. I, I, wanna, I, wa I just feel like I want to inspire faith in the place today because I, I shared this with, with some of our directors last weekend, just a story of prayer in my own life because I don't get this right all the time. Sometimes I want to take things into my own strength, but a little bit over a year ago, God said, yo, OC, it's time to move out of the three bedroom, two bath, turn it into a rental property. I'm not gonna tell you what's next, whether you're gonna build a house, buy a house. And so I'm like, okay, what do we do? So we moved in with my mother-in-law. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. God bless her. She let five people move into her house, three kids under the age of six. Yes, she's amazing. But let me tell you, after about three days in the crib, even though I was grateful, I was definitely second guessing because all five of us were in two bedrooms. All of a sudden, I'm sharing a bedroom with my wife and my youngest son, Royce. I love him dearly, but I started despising this man. <laughs> You're killing my game, man. You need to get out of here. Which then entered me into like about a month of just laying there every night with my eyes wide open, bitter, like, God, how's this going to work out? What are we going to do here? I remember there was a specific moment where I was just, and this is true of even what I was feeling this week. When we lean into fear, the result will always be overwhelm, anxiety. It's just, it's just what it is. But when we lean into the Father, that's when we experience peace. And I remember a moment of surrender where I was like, okay, God, you, I'm in the middle. Like, talk about a waiting season. I don't know what's next. I'm starting to feel overwhelmed, fearful, even like a little bit of shame because I'm like, I'm supposed to be the, the, the leader. Like, I wanna be faithful to you, but I'm trying to be responsible here. Is this responsible? Like, I'm a grown adult, 34 years old in my mother-in-law's house with my family of five. Like, what's going on here? And I remember God was, there was just this moment of surrender, and he's like, I got this. Well, we were in a season where, obviously, the market was crazy, so I'm like, gosh, I don't wanna buy an existing house. This is a terrible time. Like, it's gonna be, I'm gonna buy it up here, and then it's gonna maybe, you know, lose some value. So I'm like, I'd love to build right now. And, and so we were considering both options. Well, all of a sudden, the, the builder that we were gonna work with, he and I decided we were gonna grab coffee. So we meet up for coffee, and we're having coffee. And it's so bizarre because basically I had, I had come to this meeting saying either, either this is gonna be a sign that we're gonna move forward with this or it's, or it's just done dealing. Like we're just, we're making the choice. It's done, we're gonna go buy a house. We get through like an hour meeting, like towards the tail end. And he shares with me that there's this house that they had started that this couple was building and then something happened. I don't know the details on that, but they, they ended up backing out of this deal and it was in the neighborhood that we were looking at, on the plot that we were looking at, in the same floor plan layout that we were gonna build. Oh, and by the way, check this out. Three years prior to this, uh, there was this startup company that asked my family to film a commercial for their tool that was gonna launch. And we shot the video of basically this family moving into this house in the same floor plan model that God was opening the door for. <laughs> Why am I telling you this story? Because here's the crazy part. The first time I ever had a, like a prophetic dream that God was gonna build us a home was the night before PT gave the message, build the house. I think he might have been in Nehemiah. <laughs> I didn't look at his notes that time, but I came up, and here's the crazy part. He and our mentor, Doc Greenwald, were in the dream, and this builder that ended up building our house. I'm just trying to testify to our good, good God. I'm not sharing this to like say, look at me, this is all God. 
But I'm here to declare today that God wants to release his heart with you in the secret place in prayer. Would we be a praying church? Join us on Wednesday. I want to see the prayer meeting on Wednesday bigger than this moment right here because there's something that powerful that happens when we pray. Nehemiah was a praying man. Come on, does anybody believe this? Are you feeling this today? Do we not serve a good God? He cared because he prayed. He cared because he prayed. Okay, let's get to number three and close this deal out. Chapter two, here it is. Early the following spring and in the month of Nisan, during the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was serving the king his wine. I had never before appeared sad in his presence. So the king asked me, so see this? Like the burden started to impact the way that he walked around. And that, that's oftentimes how you can even discern if God is, is asking something of you. Is it, it starts to, like you're like, dude, I gotta do something about this. It, it's, like, it's like you've never met a pregnant woman when they're in like the ninth month. They're like, I gotta get this thing out of me. Hello, all the ladies are like, amen, brother. But that, like that, like God, like puts a woe, a burden in you, like you're in prayer, and it's like, okay, that something needs to happen. So the king asked him, why are you looking so sad? You don't look sick to me. You must be deeply troubled. Then I was terrified, but I replied. In the midst of being terrified, I love this. Long live the king. How can I not be sad for this for the city where my ancestors are buried is in ruins and the gates have been destroyed by fire. The king asked, well, how can I help you? Don't you love how God will use secular people for sacred purposes? With a prayer to the God of heaven, have you ever been there? You're like in mid conversation and in your mind you're like, God, I need help if I'm gonna minister to this person in the name of Jesus. No, that's like inner dialogue. Okay, maybe that's for layers down the, down the road. If it pleases the king, and if you are pleased with me, your servant, send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. So then he makes a bunch of requests in verses six through eight, and then you jump down to 8b, and it says this, and the king granted these requests because the gracious hand of God was on me. No delay, verse 11, so I arrived in Jerusalem three days later. In parenting, we talk about slow obedience is no obedience. This man, three days later, he's in Jerusalem. I titled this message, Why Do I Care So Much? How Caring Leads to Your Calling is the subtitle. He, he had to do something about it, and he was bold enough to, to, to ask the king to be released. And so the, the, the third thing that I want to share with us is he cared. He showed that he cared when he, when he went, when he, he, he had to go. He had to go. He had to go. He had to go do something about it. He had to go. And, and he gets to Jerusalem. And I love it because, man, if you're a leader in this place, just go study Nehemiah's process. He gets to this city. He doesn't just show up and start telling them what he's gonna do. He continues to pray and gets in the secret place and asks God for the plan for how to execute this. He leans in, he gets the plan. Then he's able, because he's got a plan and he's got confidence in the plan and he know who gave him the plan and he know who will fulfill the plan, now he stands before the people with conviction in his heart. And some of you are leaders, maybe you failed in casting vision because you haven't received the vision first. You gotta first receive the vision so you can go before your people with boldness, knowing that that's the direction God's called you. And so he stands before him, and all of a sudden you see people just like, yeah, let's do this. And I love it, chapter three. There's a phrase in there that's powerful. PT's been talking about this all week, but it says next to him, next to him, and it was, they were gonna rebuild this wall and they were gonna do it together. And there were certain people groups and families that owned a certain part of the wall. So the picture that I get is like they were like shoulder to shoulder. And this, this thing wasn't easy. They experienced a ton of opposition. 
Tobiah, Sambalat, throwing shade. They tried three different times to kind of disrupt this project. And we just need to know that if we say yes to going, you and I are gonna have a target on our backs. This is not a playground, this is a battlefield, but it's worth it. Do I got any warriors in the house of God today? I'm thankful for the two warriors on the front row serving an FCA after an NFL career, saying we just wanna give our lives to God. Feel a stirring to plant a church but have no experience. So they move their whole family to Miami, Florida, Fort Lauderdale to be exact. They go on staff at Calvary Fort Lauderdale and the plan is to be on staff for five years. After two years, God begins to stir their heart. Lay a burden on their hearts for this city. They go to the mountaintops and pray. And God says, it's time to go now. So they go boldly to their lead pastor, just like Nehemiah went to the king. I'm sure he could see that something was on them. And he said, well, let's take the next seven days and pray about this. So what happens during those seven days? Of all places in America, a young man goes into Von Mar and shoots people in this city. So they go back to their pastor and he says, you gotta go because there's a generation that needs you. They came here with no plans. They didn't know how to start a church. It started in a living room and then it started meeting in a middle school. And some of you have been with us from day one. And it's so crazy because this thing is messy. We're 14 years in and we still don't have it figured out. But we just want to see people get to know the one that fulfills and satisfies. And there's many of you that have said yes. And we're not building a wall in our city. We're tearing walls down. That's what we're called to do. But we gotta say yes to going. We can't be filled with shame about being ambassadors for Christ. It's Romans 1:16. for I am unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it has the power to save. And I look around this room and I see how this gospel has transformed so many lives, so many marriages, have broken people out of addiction have granted purpose. There's people walking in their calling because you two said yes. So the question is, is what is the cost of your yes? Who are the people that are called to follow you? Yes, leaders go first, but they don't go alone. If you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go together. And I'm here to declare that in 2023, if we'll lock arms, we'll see God do something in this city that we've never seen and revival will break out in the heartland of the United States of America. We're not playing church, we are the church. The church doesn't exist for us, we're the church and we exist for the world, do you believe it? It's so cool because when you say, you see the burden in my heart? This woe has become my flow. And here's the thing, we all got different gifts. But my gift is, like, I want, I woe to me if I don't preach this gospel. And it's gonna look different for some of you. It's like, woe, woe to me if the church isn't walking in the prophetic gifting, if we don't understand, like, what is it? Prayer, pro prophecy. Woe to me, man, if people walk in and the lobby has trash all over the floor. Woe to me if somebody drives in and doesn't have a parking space and turns away and walks away. Woe to me if the next generation isn't being trained up. I don't know what it is, but we need to ask God to give us a burden because listen, this thing we're a part of is bigger than the part we play. And so I'm gonna pray right now. God, we just thank you. We thank you right now for this picture, this story because you're the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. And I pray that we would just, we would carry hope in our hearts, we would be hope dealers, that we, we, we can't really resonate with building a wall, 
but we can resonate with people being in ruins. We can resonate with seeing the rubble and it is our heart's desire to see restoration and reconstruction of marriages and families, to see addictions broken, to see a high school across the street on fire for King Jesus, to see the idols of our culture broken down. Yes, very good things, God. But we cast down youth sports in the name of Jesus. We love it, but we, th- we lay down that idol. We thank you for resource and money that, that many people in this place today aren't wondering if they're gonna have lunch. They're wondering where. Bring us back to why we exist, Lord. Reinstate purpose. And I pray if somebody walked in here today feeling broken, they would know that they didn't walk into a museum today, they walked into a hospital. And Jesus, you're here to meet them. We declare all this in his name. Amen. We're here because Jesus came. He is Emmanuel. We're talking about it on the 24th. This, this, this God became man in, in flesh. He came to earth lived the life that you and I couldn't, and he died the death that you and I deserve because, listen, all sin really means is missing the mark, and we've all missed the mark at least one time, and if we've missed the mark one time, that separates us from a holy God. I'm sorry to give you the bad news, but it's not your good works that are gonna get you to heaven. When Jesus hung on that cross, he bridged the gap between us, sinful man, and a holy God, and it wasn't the nails that kept him there. It was his love for you and I. And I believe there are people that walked in here today and you have good intentions. You're not a bad person. You actually are thinking of the things of God, but you've never come to this place of receiving the free gift of salvation. It's not something you earn. It's something you receive. You just got to say yes to it. But the Bible talks about being born again. We're born again when we believe in this by faith. And so we end each encounter with that opportunity. You maybe came in here today and maybe you're feeling hopeless and broken and confused. Or maybe you came in here today and you're polished. You're driving the Mercedes Benz. You've got a $400,000 house and you think that you have it all together, but you're recognizing that something is missing. So church, let's stand to our feet. And in a moment of faith, the band's gonna play and you're gonna get out of your seat and come forward and say, I surrender. I need this Jesus. That act of surrender is an act of repentance. You're gonna turn away from your old life and start walking in the new one because he who is in Christ Jesus is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. So if you're being stirred, church, we're gonna begin praying. And if that's you, just make your way forward right now. Man, go ahead and play. If if I'm speaking to you, come forward. I'd love to lead you in this prayer. All are welcome at the table. There is a place just for you. No condemnation at the table. There is a place just for you.
privilege to lead you in this moment. I'm gonna give you the words, but this is your heart connecting with God. And uh, I just believe that there may be somebody online that's joined us, this is for you as well. So if you guys are ready, I'm gonna lead you in this prayer. Say, Lord God, I invite you inside to be my God, to be my savior, and to be my friend. Thank you that you cared so much about me, that you left heaven and lived the life I never could. Today I acknowledge that you went to the cross to pay my penalty for sin. Today I believe in that by faith and I receive it by your grace. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Let's say that again. Fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I can walk this new life out one day at a time. Jesus, I wanna be burdened for your purposes and not my own, so I can continue to love you and love people. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, church, let's celebrate. got a team that would love to give you a Bible and just pray with you real quick. So go ahead and head this way. Come on, church. Let's give it up for them. Proud of you.